Accidents are unexpected. Would you know what to do at the accident scene? Be prepared before an accident. Avra and Smith presents the My Lawyer app for your smartphone. Download it for free at avra.com. And be prepared when you need it most. Okay, welcome to the final Pat Dooley show of this college football season. Appreciate everybody for clicking on again. Obviously, in the Swamp Saturday was a kind of a surreal setting. Small crowd, a lot of empty seats, almost looked like a spring game, kind of a gloomy day, misty, and uh, Florida's down 22-7 to against Furman. Nobody saw that coming. Uh, you know, it, it was embarrassing, I think, for the Gators and the Gator fans, and uh, they obviously came back and, and, and won the game fairly easily. Andre DeBose having a huge game, but, you know, it just kind of tells you a little bit about this team that sometimes they, they, they've got to play at a peak. At not only play their best, but be emotionally at a peak to be successful, and, and they weren't for that game, and it almost bit them really badly. Uh, they adjusted their defense, but they still gave up a ton of yards. Um, you know, they obviously the, the two big plays to DeBose were a big factor in the game, and uh, John Brantley played pretty well. But, uh, you know, they got the win, and that makes them bowl eligible. So uh, that's the good news. And, you know, it, it is important. It is important to get those practices in, but it's important to, for your brand to be out there. And it's important. It's a lot better to go recruiting – in December, when you've got a bowl game coming up, than it is if you, you – by the way, Coach, what bowl are you in? Oh, we didn't make a bowl this year. You know, it's just not good. So, all in all, it works out for the Gators. They are bowl eligible. It almost seems sure they're going to be in the Gator Bowl. There are a couple of scenarios that would keep them away. I know that they want – the Gator Bowl wants Florida. The Florida brand is a big factor. The fact that uh, there's a lot of people on the committee that are Gator fans, including the, uh, the head of the, uh, the CEO of the Gator Bowl – um, you know, there's also the fact that you're talking about a team that has won two national championships in the last five years. So, you know, Florida's still hot, even at six and six or seven and five. Uh, the only way that they wouldn't end up there is, I, and I wrote about this this week, is if uh, you end up with an Alabama LSU national championship game, but Georgia wins the SEC, which is possible uh, for that to happen. Georgia would then have to go to the Sugar Bowl, and you would have uh, everybody kind of get bumped up a spot. Now, Everybody get bumped up a spot, but it still might not work out. They still may end up there. But Florida could end up in a Chick-fil-A if that happens. But we'll just wait and see. But I, I'll just put it this way. I've made reservations over in Jacksonville for that week already. So it looks like that's where they're going to go. And, you know, like we said earlier, it's important for the practices. It's important to get to, to just be in a bowl game and keep that streak alive. Of course, if they beat FSU, does the Chick-fil-A look at them any differently? I don't know. The Chick-fil-A really wants Auburn. Auburn's two hours away and defending national champs. So that's probably still where they're going to go. But if they beat FSU, you know, it certainly is a good way to close the season. And, and this is what I'm writing for Saturday's paper. So when you see it there, if you've clicked on here, you already know what I'm, what I'm going to write. But what, I, what I'm going to say is, you know, I keep hearing, well, we can salvage the season if we beat FSU. We can salvage the season if we can beat Florida. I got news for you guys on both teams. Your seasons aren't salvageable. They're not. These are both very disappointing seasons. FSU started the year ranked in fifth. They're probably going to finish the year unranked. That's not a good – that's not – you didn't salvage anything. Well, we won the Mythical State Championship. Big deal. You, you beat two mediocre teams, two teams that could easily end up 6-6 six and six if Miami loses. One of them's not even going to a bowl because they chose not to. And the other one's going to a bowl, uh, you know, the low, a very low-tier bowl. Winning the state championship this year is nothing to brag about. But um, that, and, and I'm not criticizing FSU. I'm just saying there's there's nothing salvageable. You'd want rather much rather win the game. It's a lot more fun to live with your friends and relatives who may be fans of the other team uh, if you win this game. And you know there certainly is uh, maybe I don't know how I don't think the game itself has anything to do with recruiting, but you like to get a little momentum going. But uh, salvage the season? I don't think so. It'll be an interesting game. We certainly watched FSU. Uh, lose to uh, Virginia. We didn't see that coming. And uh, they really, on the offense, the last two weeks have done nothing. So uh, it gives Fl Florida's got a puncher's chance in this game, I think. But, uh, you know, the way Florida's played all year, unless they play error-free ball, they probably won't beat Florida State. I mean, that's the bottom line. They've got to not turn the ball over. If they get turnovers, great, but just don't turn it over. Uh, try to get some turnovers. Don't commit stupid penalties. And make all the make some plays, you know. That, that's all it's come down to all year, and they haven't done that. Of course, I've picked all 11 of their games right, so you have to wait till Friday's paper to find out who I'm picking here, and then you know who's going to win. Um, Saturday night, you know, I don't know if you read my column 
that I wrote last Saturday, how I just wanted the season to end. And I love college football. It's my favorite sport. But with, between the Penn State stuff and Ohio State and North Carolina and Miami and conference realignment and covering a team that's not playing certainly below its potential and no access to them and everything, I just wanted the season to get over with. Uh, Saturday night changed me. It brought me back. It's like I've, you know, it's almost like I, I basically was cheating on college football, sleeping in somebody else's house, sleeping at a buddy's house because I'd had enough of it, and now I came back. And, and hopefully college football welcomes me back with open arms. Saturday night was phenomenal. It was so much fun. You had the uh, Baylor-Oklahoma game, obviously. You had USC-Oregon. I was rooting for Oklahoma and Oregon, but still, they were unbelievable games. Tennessee-Vandy turned out to be unbelievable. The referees blew a call twice. Two wrongs made a right for once. Uh, and obviously, the FSU in. So college football brought me back in. I'm, I'm back, and uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we won't split up again. Finally, uh, here, uh, obviously the Urban Meyer stories out there. It's been a big deal. You know, I think everybody's just got to kind of calm down if you're a Florida fan. Uh, it's his life, not yours in the first place. You may feel jilted. Those, these things happen in, in college football and in everything. You know, people leave. People go find other jobs. We'll see if he takes it. I think it's I, – I was on radio up in Columbus. I said 70-30 that he will, just talking. We had a long talk about it. Um, you know, and, you know, I think his legacy should be unbelievable here. What he did here. Look at his record against your rivals, the teams you hate the most. That should be enough right there to make you remember him fondly. We'll talk about that with our panel a little bit later about their feelings about what if Urban goes to Ohio State. That's going to do it for our opening right now. It's time for three things. Accidents are unexpected. Would you know what to do at the accident scene? Be prepared before an accident. Avra and Smith presents the My Lawyer app for your smartphone. Download it for free at avra.com. And be prepared when you need it most. All right, it's time for three things. Number one, I, I mentioned earlier that Vandy, Tennessee game. It was amazing. And, and I talked about this on, on one of the earlier shows, that the quality of officiating in this all around the country, I'm not just saying the SEC, really shaky this year. I've noticed it a lot. That play, if you, if you didn't see it, uh, Tennessee got a pick six. The referee clearly blew the whistle. You could hear it from Gainesville. And once you blow that whistle, the ball's down. There is no reviewing. They blew it that his knee didn't touch. They said his knee touched. And they blew the whistle, and you're not supposed to review it. So they blew it in every way. They ended up getting the call right. But, uh, you know, between that game and, and then, the, then the Florida State-Virginia game, where there wasn't bad calls, but, you know, uh, E.J. Manuel gets sacked on fourth down. You're like, well, that game's over. Oh, it's a face mask. They throw a pass. They, clock runs out. Really bad play call, by the way. Clock runs out. The game's over. No, it's not. We're reviewing it. He didn't catch it. First time ever, I think, that fans were rooting for their player not to have caught the pass. And, uh, and then they get the, the, the field goal, and there's a penalty. It looks like a false start. Ten-second runoff. Game's over. It's still not over. It was intriguing. In that case, I think the referees got all the calls right. It just was bizarre to watch it. And the, and the Vandy, Tennessee game really blew it. In fact, Steve Shaw came out and said so. Number two, for all the stuff that's going on at Penn State, you've got to give those guys a lot, those players, and the, and the coaches that are still there, a lot of credit. Not only did they, you know, fight back against Nebraska, but then to go back and win next, you know, the game last week to stay in contention for the Big Ten championship, you know, you got to give them – I mean, nobody's had to deal with as much as they've had to deal with. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sure somebody will point out, well, what about when, you know, certainly Oklahoma State having to deal with the, the women's coach dying and the plane crash and stuff. That, they're all distractions. But Penn State has been the focus of everybody for the last three weeks. And to do what they've done on the field, you got to give them credit. I know this much, though. There is not a bull in America that wants them. Somebody's going to get stuck with them. And then guess what? The circus is going to come to town. Nobody wants them. I certainly am hoping they don't end up in the Gator Bowl because, you know, what are you going to write about all week? But, but Penn State. So, I, you know, I'm just I've, – I've written, I'm written out on them. Finally, number three on the three things, the Heisman is in a mess. I mean, I don't know who to vote for. And right now, if you ask me to vote, I don't even know who I would vote for. Thankfully, I've got two more weeks of football. You know, um, Robert Griffin III came back into the picture. Trent Richards is still a factor. Do I, how seriously do I consider Case Keenum and, and Kellen Moore, who've had great careers and uh, Keenum putting up amazing numbers? Uh, you know, Blackman, Whedon at Oklahoma State, uh, Andrew Luck, is he the front runner now? I, it, it's a mess. And you just got to kind of let 
the whole season play out. I mentioned this in my column, or might have been on Twitter, I don't remember, somewhere, that if your ballot comes in before the last week of the season, when you consider that Oklahoma and Oklahoma State are playing a regular season game now, this isn't a, and I've had people argue, look, the reason I vote before the championship games is because not everybody gets an opportunity to play in one. Well, this is a regular season game. In fact, there are several that day. If you vote before that, you should have your ballot pulled. That's my opinion. It's the whole season. It's a season award, not an 11-game award. But uh, I'm, I'm hoping something becomes clear in the next two weeks before I send my ballot in. All right, that's going to do it for three things. We've got a great panel to, to wrap up this season. Lee McGriff and Neil Anderson will join me when we come back. Accidents are unexpected. Would you know what to do at the accident scene? Be prepared before an accident. Avra and Smith presents the My Lawyer app for your smartphone. Download it for free at avra.com. And be prepared when you need it most. Okay, welcome to our panel. I've got two of my favorite people in the world joining me here. A couple of all SDC former Gators, of course, Neil Anderson and Lee McGriff. Lee McGriff does the uh, color commentary on the radio as well. And I uh, appreciate you guys for coming on. All right, we, we've got five topics we'll go through here, starting out with the first one. Uh, we'll start with you, Lee. Would you like to see an all-SEC national title game? I would. I'd like to see Alabama against Arkansas. Really? Not LSU? That's right. I'd like Arkansas to, to uh, run wild on LSU and stun everybody and, and uh, give Arkansas another shot at, at Alabama. And why, is it, why do you want to see them instead of LSU? Um, I don't really know. I mean, I'm, I'm getting a kick out of two SEC teams yeah. being there, and uh, I've had enough of LSU. So, <laughs> you know, and I think Arkansas's offense out of everybody in the conference right now is probably the most fun offense to watch. Right. How about you, Neil? I'd love to see LSU and Alabama. Uh, a replay of that game. I mean, first time 9-6, uh, two great teams. And uh, I think they're the best two teams in college football. So. I think it would be great great for people that love to see football to watch those two teams battle. You know, I think that the important thing is that the, the coaches don't use their agendas when they're voting because you know there are coaches who are going to say, it's hard enough to compete against the SEC in recruiting. I don't want two of them playing the national title. Vote for the two best teams. Right. You know, I think don't. that happens. You have Alabama and LSU. It's just, just, so much, just so much talent. On, on both sides of the, 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 on each team, I mean, on both sides of the ball, uh, so much talent on the field. Lee, when we saw LSU and Alabama, it was like boys against men, against skaters. I mean, and Florida's not a terrible team. They're, they're an average team, but, I mean, they just had big, strong, fast guys. They were the prototypical SEC teams. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and in fact, for me, as I get older, I mean, that's an evolution back to the past. This is the way football used to be mm -hmm. played through the mid to late 60s, through the early 70s, maybe even late 70s. That's the way everybody played football. And uh, they, they've just gone back and mastered it in a more powerful way than everybody else. But, um, you know, there, there is no question what they've done position by position. They dominated the game against the Gators in every way. Yeah, I keep telling people that Nick Saban and Les Miles have had years to build these rosters. Will Muschamp's had one recruiting class that was pretty much urban recruits anyway. So give him some time and see how he does. I mean, Everybody's yeah, you, out. You've, and you've pointed that out. Yeah. That Saban struggled in his first year. Six and six. And Lost exactly. to uh, Louisiana Monroe. I think Houston, too. Yeah. But that, that people forget fast when <laughs> they start winning. So I, I, I agree. Muschamp is going to need a little time to see how he does when he gets to people that he believes in right. and get them in here. Uh, all right. Uh, second on our, our – how much credit does Georgia deserve, Neil? I mean, look, they won nine in a row, and that's to be said. They, the combined record of the SEC teams they beat, I think, it was 12 and 39. But they still won those games. Uh, you know, I've kind of take, nibbled away at their credibility, but how much credit do they deserve? I think they deserve a lot of credit. I mean, you, you got to face who shows up on Saturday. I mean, if, if it's a great team for the team that's not so great, you still got to go out and do your job. Um, and it's not easy. I mean, people come in to beat you, and they know your record sure. and know your history. But, um, you know, I think they deserve a lot of credit because they've gotten it done on the field. You know, they, they've beaten who they should beat, and that, that's important sometimes that you beat the people that you should beat. Well, the other thing, too, Lee, is it's not like uh, you know, Greg McGarrity set the SEC schedule. I mean, you schedule the non conference but the, the league is just how it rotates into your, yeah. into your block. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Georgia is the best team in the East right now, you know. They're healthier. They're more healthy than a South sure. Carolina. They, they're the best team in the East, so they should win the East. They are going to represent the East. However, 
when they meet that West opponent, I think it will be all put back in the, pers uh, the, the perspective that you're, that you're alluding to. Yeah, you know, the funny thing is, it's, is it ended up being how you played against Auburn that decided the East. Yeah. Because South Carolina blew it sure. home and uh, Georgia Seal Club. I mean, they destroyed them. So uh, give them credit for that. I, you know, look, it's the way it works out sometimes. Just sometimes you get an easy schedule, sometimes you get Florida's. Yeah, you know? right. Yeah, you, I mean, we we all remember there was a time everybody's carrying on about the West, but this you, this is how the, the the East used to be yeah. for a long time. So it, it shifts around and moves around, as you said. The schedules get set and chips fall where they may. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about when you guys are playing back in the old days. Okay, um, who was your biggest rivalry, and who do you think Florida's biggest rival is right now? I mean, obviously Florida playing a rivalry game this week with Florida State. Yeah, I think uh, this too ebbs and flows. Uh, the, the answer is to when I was playing, I, I would say clearly Georgia was. Um, Auburn was right on the heels of that. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I, I always loved it. was a great traditional game, and I hate that it's not there all the time, the Auburn-Florida game. Um, and then, of course, FSU. But during those days, we dominated them so. But it still really mattered uh, that, that you beat FSU. That, that was something that... that if you got beat by FSU, that was that was an awful thing to do. So that was it was a big rivalry, but but truly the thing that made people crazy happy was to be to be George Hart. And and I think now um, probably Tennessee, even though Tennessee's not very good right now. But if they get good, it just seems to be that's the most passionate game. Um, and the FSU game is. You know, I think we'll feel this, the, the rivalry of that game is, is still very much alive this year. Yeah, and it will, it, you know, if you figure both teams are going to get better, you know, part of the reason the FSU maybe has ebbed and flowed, as you said, it, and I'm a big believer that Florida's biggest rival is depends on the year. You know, there have been years, when, I mean, look, in 2008, Georgia was their biggest rival because Georgia beat them here before and stormed right. storm the field. But there have been years, certainly in the, in the 90, mid-90s, late-90s, when Tennessee was the biggest rival. Well, how about when you played? Well, I agree with what you said. I mean, it, it changes. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had years when, for example, when Auburn had Bo Jackson. I mean, that was a huge rival. Uh, and then there are other times it wasn't. And Georgia's always, you know, being played in a, at a neutral site in Jacksonville. That's always been a big rival. One of the biggest, I think, for the fans. And, uh, and if you're Florida Gator, Florida State is always up at the top of the list. Uh, although similar to what Lee said, when I played uh, those four years we were forcing, we never lost to them. Right. But it was still a big rivalry. I mean, you wanted to win that game. You played against guys that uh, I played on the Ulster, Florida All-Star game. And, you know, guys that you met, you sure. played against there. And that was a big game as far as recruiting goes and everything else. And, uh, and, and that one always stands at the top. Did Charlie uh, Pell treat those games differently or was he pretty much the same? Was he pretty much uptight all the time? <laughs> yeah, he, was, he was pretty uptight most of the time, but I think, it, you know, you get to, ready to play a Florida State game like that, uh, Auburn, there was a little extra. You could feel it in the air. I mean, you knew when you got to practice that week and you showed up that there was something special about that week. Uh, you could tell. You yeah. saw it from both sides as well, a player and a coach. Well, I did. And uh, mentioning Coach Bell, a couple of quick funny stories about him. I can tell you how much he hated Georgia. <laughs> I actually saw him in a staff meeting before the Georgia game, the morning before the Georgia game, light two cigarettes, uh, one after the other, and put them in his mouth. And we thought, okay, he's a little uptight. And then in the locker room, Neil, I, you were there, he told the team that if, if they didn't beat Georgia, even their mothers wouldn't love them. <laughs> He wasn't You're also <laughs> it's, it's a different feeling, though, when you play out with guys. Absolutely. No question about it. Uh, all right. Now, number four, uh, obviously, there's been a lot of news about Urban Meyer. Uh, many of you read the story I had in the paper Tuesday. Uh, Meyer saying he'll have to make a decision. He still has some concerns. But, but I'll start with you, Neil. Would your opinion of Urban Meyer change if he took the Ohio State job? Uh, not really. I mean, I, I look at him as a, he's a football coach. He's been coaching football for a long time. and. And I think when you do that and you live that lifestyle and, and it's in your blood, um, a lot of things can happen uh, along the mm -hmm. way. You can say some things, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, you're a football coach. And right now he's doing the, uh, the commentary and, and the TV stuff with ESPN. But uh, it wouldn't surprise me you know, if, if he decided to take it. Uh, just because of the simple fact, I think you, that's just, it's in your heart and, and you miss it. And... Um, so I, I wouldn't be shocked at all. 
you know, Lee, uh, I was telling you before, it's not like he's taking a job at oh, South Carolina, you know, where he's on Florida's schedule every every year. If he goes to Ohio State, he may never see the, the Gators again. But uh, what, what about you? What's your take on it? Well, I'll abbreviate my my perspective. But one, I'm with I'm with Neil. I mean, the fact that he wants to coach and is capable of getting the Ohio State job, understand that he wants to do it. That's really about his life and his family's life. And so I totally get that. I, I think the things that, that, that frustrate Florida fans in general is too many times Urban says one thing and does another. So it's not the fact that he's coaching, it's just the picture he tried to paint of himself and what he's trying to do with his life and what the Gators meant to him. And I'm not saying that nothing the Gators don't mean anything, but he, he painted one picture and he's going to do another. But when you take that trivial piece away from it, good for him, go coach. Well, yeah, to, to fans, that's a big piece. I mean, yeah, you it look is. at you know you, you want uh, honesty, integrity, and all the things you hear that a coach wants his players and, and team to have. And then you look at some of the things they do, and it's tough. Uh, as a fan of that program to, to accept that. Sure, sure. And I, and I think if, Neil, if he would have just said, I, I, I'm worn out, I'm dealing with some health problems, I've got to gather myself, I don't know what my future holds. Need a year off. Right. I just need a year off yeah. or five years off. I don't know what I need, but I know I just can't stay in the saddle here right now. I have to take right. a break. Instead of going the extra mile and acting like, you know, I'm here forever, I'm a gator forever, exactly. I just want to live here with my family, I'm going to spend all my time with my family and all that. Right. That's the picture he painted, and so that's why I think Gator fans are going, oh, he says that, but look what he's doing one year later. So, right. Well, and, and that's true. I will say this, so, and I had a long talk with Herman the other day. Um, when he when he stepped away from it, he had no idea that so hot state job was going to open up, he, unless he knew the tattoo part or something. I mean, he had no idea, and, and there's only two jobs he would even consider, and that's that one and another name. Yeah. Right, so, but, but but knowing that, you know, and, and I, I agree with what Lee said, it's kind of a PR thing. Yeah. You know, it's a way to say it. You know, you can phrase it so, you know, I'm just burning out, don't know what I'm going to do, but right now I need some time off. But I can tell you, if I was in coaching, I was in his position, and my battery re was recharged, and I had a chance to go coach at Ohio State, mm -hmm. not many jobs like that. Yeah, there is, and, I, and it's funny because I was on a bunch of radio shows, and I was telling them, they asked me, said, well, wouldn't the pressure be the same? I go, you're going to have sanctions. You may not have a bowl game. You, know, you may not be able to compete for a national team. So, no, the pressure won't be as severe yeah, to least, start out at least. Exactly. Not immediately. Yeah. yeah he'll get a grace period. Finally, on our, uh, on our panel discussion here, the legacies of these seniors, Lee, how do you think they'll be remembered? Yeah, I'll tell you how I'll remember them. I mean, they, they were guys that were a part of some really good times. But anymore nowadays, what I see is these are guys that saw it to the end. And for most athletes, you know, it's it's not a straight path. It's right. there's up and downs. There's disappointments. These guys didn't walk away from anything. And John they, Brandon being a perfect example. Absolutely. Yeah. And he has stayed in the saddle. All nine of the seniors will graduate. How about that? Yeah. You know, they're going to see that to the end. They're going to walk out of here with their degrees. I've heard nobody whining as far as these seniors are concerned. And you know they they stood tall. I hope they go play their brains out Saturday and, and end up on a win. Personally, I respect that as much as winning a championship, maybe more, because that that's more reflective of who they are, and it's probably a lesson in life that's going to be even more meaningful to them than just winning a championship. They've hung in there, worked through tough stuff, and there's something to these guys. I respect them. Well, but John Brantley is a guy who could have walked away. Any one of the, of the five years he's been here, you're right. You know, Tebow comes right. back. Uh, you know how many quarterbacks would have walked away? I mean, we see it all the time. Right. And and in Dempsey and Rainey's case, I mean, they were huge factors in the 08 and 09 teams that went 26 and two. Yeah, unfortunately, I think you know a lot of fans won't remember that. So they so remember this year and last year. Remember the, the last couple of years, uh, the championship year. I think you'll remember uh, Tebow, yeah. Rainey. Uh, uh, Percy Harvin, I think. Uh, so I don't think these guys will be remembered for the championship. They were just they were part of that team. But I think what what's happened the last couple of years, unfortunately, will be how they'll be remembered, uh, including Brandon. Yeah, and the thing is, it's going to be a kind of a quiet senior day. You know, first of all, you only have five guys who really are a factor. 
and uh, the Randy Depps, Brantley, Deontay Thompson, who's really not had a great career here, and uh, Jay Howell. I mean, the rest of her walk-ons and, right. and guys. So, but when you watch Senior Day, you'll probably go, I see why Florida six and five. There are no seniors out yeah. there. Right. You know, there's no leadership. There's no you know guys who've been through the mill. You know, pulling them through. So, yeah. Yeah, that's part of it as well. Well, that's going to do it for our panel discussion. What a great way to go out as we end uh, the Pat Dooley Show. And uh, it was a great season of, of great guests. And I appreciate every one of them for coming in. You know who you are out there. Neil Anderson and Lee McGriff. We'll take a break. We'll come right back with the list. Accidents are unexpected. Would you know what to do at the accident scene? Be prepared before an accident. Avra and Smith presents the My Lawyer app for your smartphone. Download it for free at avra.com. And be prepared when you need it most. All right, welcome back to the uh, Pat Dooley Show, my last list of the year. And, of course, it being Thanksgiving weekend, these are the things that I'm thankful for involving college football. Obviously, I'm thankful for a great family, a great wife, Great kids, great uh, mom and dad. Very lucky guy to be as old as I am and still have parents that are alive. So I'm thankful to all of them. But as far as college football goes, here's what I'm thankful for. Number one, college football overtime. I love it. I love college football overtime. I've said this before. It's my favorite thing in the world. I love the way they do it, the format for it, the fact that you could end up with a game that, that where you see seven touchdowns scored in overtime. And unfortunately, the other night when I'm watching these, all these great games, it looks like all of them are going to overtime, and only one of them did. I was a little disappointed in that. I wanted to see, like, the, what was the game between? It was Faulkner and Union the other night. It was 95-89 or something. <laughs> That's my kind of football. Number two, I am thankful for weekday games because, you know, I don't know if you know it or not, but sitcoms and variety shows, I'm not one of these guys who's going to sit and watch uh, The Sing-Off or yeah, America's Got Talent or whatever, you know, Dancing with the Stars. And even if it's Miami of Ohio at Ohio, I'll sit and watch it. It's college football. And as we wind down the season, you know, don't forget to embrace it. And just and you might want to sit down and watch one of these games. And there may be a quarterback there that five years from now you're talking about in the NFL. So I really liked it. And in fact, I think in the entire month of November, I don't think there was a day when there was not a football game on of some kind on television. So I'm thankful for that. Number three, I'm thankful for great weekends that come out of nowhere. We saw this last weekend. You know, I was talking about how oh, this, this weekend's terrible. There's no great games. It ended up being one of the great weekends in college football. And that's why the game is the best. Because when you think it's going to be a big deal, doesn't always live up to it. Often does. But when you think it's not a big weekend and the games aren't that good, it'll come out of nowhere. And you're just like going, what? They're, they're losing? And next thing you know, you're running to the TV. So I'm thankful for that. Number four, I'm thankful for SEC stadiums. You know, I'm lucky to cover this conference because – in this conference, the stadiums are all tremendous. Uh, look, e except Vanderbilt. Okay, we all know that. But even Vandy, I love because we stay right there next to the hotel. You walk out of, the, out of your room and into the press box. It's unbelievable. SEC stadiums are the best. They're, they're huge. They're, they're cool. I, I really enjoy m almost all the press boxes as well. Um, not, I'm not a big fan of the ones that are closed in, especially like uh, the Gator Bowl. Uh, I still call it the Gator Bowl, Florida, Georgia. I uh, don't really like that we can't hear the crowd, but most of them we can hear the crowd too, and that's pretty cool. Even, even in South Carolina, they open up the chalices so you can hear the crowd. And, and that, that's another example of a great stadium. Uh, there's nothing quite like that at the end of the game when you walk down and there's four or five minutes ago and you get on the field and you're down there. You talk about changing your perspective of what it was like in the press box, but I'm thankful for that. And number five, I am thankful that I covered the University of Florida. You know, Jeremy Foley likes to remind me of that, but uh, that I'm not covering Mississippi State or somebody. But it's been a great run. Now, look, we all know this year has not been a lot of fun uh, covering the Gators. They've, they've been losing games the same way. But for a kid who grew up born in Gainesville and also, you know, was a childhood big fan of the Gators, came to all the games, sold hot dogs in the stands, stuff like that, to now be covering them for the last 24 years and, uh, and to be working next to my buddy Robbie Andrew, who we were – friends in high school and college and been friends forever. You know, I'm really lucky and I'm very thankful for that. I, I appreciate it. Don't think I don't for one second. I'm really thankful to all you who click on and watch this show every week and, and to all of you who read me in the Gainesville Sun too. If you don't read it and you don't click on, there's no point in doing it. And that's what I, what I do it for really is the readers. Finally, before we take off for the season, I want to pay tribute to a guy I'm thankful to have known. And that's Larry Munson. Larry Munson was, hey, look, I, I, I cover the Gators. I grew up a Gator fan. Larry Munson's just the best. And you would think, how could you like this guy? How could you, you know, because he, he broadcasts the most 
painful moment of your life, the Lindsey Scott play. But Larry Munson was, was as good as they get. Um, and just, I, I wish more guys in radio would try to be like him and just off the wall, you don't know what's coming out of his mouth next. The other thing was, oh, he's a really nice guy. I mean, he got a little cranky towards the end, obviously, who doesn't? But you know, I spent a lot of time with him when he was with the Jacksonville Bulls. Uh, he was a play-by-play -play guy for them. I remember they recovered an onside kick one time. He goes, they got it nine inches inside the 50. I mean, he was just the best. And uh, I miss him already. Uh, it's going to be, you know, it, it was sad to go to Florida, Georgia the last few years and not see him because he usually interviewed me before the game. And it was sad just not to have him there. But uh, really sad to hear this week that he passed away. And, and up, right now he's up there, you know, he's broadcasting a game up there, I'm sure. Jesus Christ has it nine inches inside the 50. So we'll uh, we say a little prayer for Larry and for, uh, for all of you out there. Have, I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. I hope you're full. And uh, we'll see what happens this week with the Gators. I'll be back next year with another 12 episodes of the, uh, of the Pat Dooley Show. Thanks again for watching. Until next time, Pat Dooley of the Gainesville Sun. I am so long from the Sunshine State. <laughs>